Now, having looked at the reasons why we model differential equations, one of the things that we hopefully got out of this is we very rarely need something more than second order. So what does the order of a differential equation refer to? And what I want to do in this little segment here is go remind you how to categorize differential <laughs> equations. So what does the order refer to? The order is the highest derivative you have. Now, in physics, we're most often interested in single things that are changing, dv dt, dx dt, um, dq dt, and then occasionally how they combine. So we saw that v being equal to dx dt and being interested in dv dt gave us the second derivative, d squared d d squared x dt squared. And that's about as high as we almost ever get. We have some fundamental variables, say x. We're interested in its change and the change in its change. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, and everything you learned in calculus, to understand the shape of the curve, you never really had to go much beyond the second derivative. The first derivative told you the slope. The second derivative told you how the slope was changing. And that gave you all the relevant interesting things, like where the maximum and the minimum were, and inflection points, and all of that stuff. So yes, to fully know everything, you have to go to higher order derivatives at times. But the reality is, the thing we're interested in how it evolves is either the quantity itself, its first derivative, or its second derivative. So very rarely will you see anything other than a second order differential equation in physics. Occasionally, like there's weird places like in elasticity, there's, um, if you think about the bending of a thin beam, it turns out to be a fourth order differential equation. Um, but that's because you're building up from forces, from displacements to forces to torques to something else, and so you get multiple derivatives. The other distinguishing feature is linear versus nonlinear. So what would determine if an equation is linear or if it's nonlinear? Okay, so that had two variables being multiplied. So let's ask this question. Um, d squared y dt squared equals minus omega naught squared y. Linear or nonlinear? Linear. This is just a parameter, you know, even though I have a squared here. The variable is linear. It never appears as a higher power than 1, even though what order is this? So second order, linear. So this is a linear equation. Uh, what about dy dt plus y squared equals 0? Linear or nonlinear? Nonlinear non y. y you have the y squared. What order is it just to practice? First order because the highest derivative is a single one. Now, what about this equation? Linear or nonlinear? D squared psi dx squared plus x squared psi of x equals 0. Who votes for nonlinear? Who's voting for linear? Who's not sure? This is a good time to turn to your neighbor, find out what they thought and why. Go. So what do we think? Linear or nonlinear? Who says nonlinear? Hold and firm. OK, who says linear? The discussion did nothing, <laughs> except make a few linear people not hold that. So this violates that theory of peer instruction, where you have people talk to each other and they come to the right answer. What is our definition of linear? What do we focus on? The variable that we're solving for. What variable are we solving for here? Psi. Does psi ever show up multiplied by itself? No. So this is fundamentally a linear equation because there's the variable. What order is it? Second. 
So what do we call, what do we do with this x squared? That's making it look nonlinear. What do we do with that? Substitution. Well, no, we, we just call it something. What, what are we calling it? It, it's a non-constant coefficient. Non-homogeneous would be making the zero something. Okay. This is just a non-constant coefficient. The coefficient depends on the variable you're taking the derivative with respect to, not the variable you're solving for. So this is a non-constant coefficient. This was a fairly obvious way to see it. If I took this equation, which will sometimes happen to you, and I wrote it as dy dt plus x cubed y squared equals zero, I'm sorry, dy dx, you might, oops, nope, I want a y, sorry, plus x cubed y equals zero, you might at first think this is nonlinear because I forgot to write my y's explicitly as x and make it all obvious. But y is the variable I'm solving for x is the variable that I'm taking the derivatives with respect to. And this will happen when you use solve in Mathematica for desolve. It's important to understand this structure because you'll have your equation and then you'll have something like that to tell it what's the function you're solving for, y of x, and then you'll have a piece to tell you that the variable you're taking derivatives with respect to is x. So you'll need this full structure. There's also a way to do it where you just write y and you write x and, and it gives you a different form of the answer. They're both useful depending on what you're doing. But this is the common thing. You want to be explicit about the function you're solving for versus the variable you're taking the derivative with respect to. Now, the other thing, so that was linear versus nonlinear. And then the other category which you had mentioned is homogeneous versus inhomogeneous or non-homogeneous. And that has to do with whether or not you have a term without any y's in it. So if I talk, if I put all my linear operators, all my derivatives together into a linear operator, If I can write it as Ly equals zero, that's homogeneous. And notice this can include constants and multiplication by things like x squared. Right? So L, for instance, might be d by dt plus t squared plus 6. Right? That's a perfectly fine L. And so that'll give me dy dt plus t squared y plus 6y. So linear equation, but it's equal to zero. So it's homogeneous. <coughs> Um, if, let's suppose this is an operator with respect to t, if all of this equals some function of t with no y's in it, then that's inhomogeneous. So this is homogeneous and this is inhomogeneous. And one of the most common and main ways to do it, or one of the reasons you have to recognize this is this type of equation you will often find what we call a particular solution to. And we'll go back to this in more detail, but we notice whatever solution you find to this equation, we can always add the solution to the homogeneous equation. Because by definition, L acting on that homogeneous solution gives me zero. So it will also solve this. So if I have Y sub H such that L acting on Y sub H equals zero, and I have some y particular that solves f of ly of t equals f of t, then y of t that's equal to y particular of t plus y homogeneous of t will also solve that. Because when I act with my linear operator on the homogeneous part, I just get zero. And that's why this kind of notation of linear operators is really helpful. Because you can easily see, right, linear operators by definition, L of A plus B is L of A plus L of B, and L of B is zero, so it all works out. This turns out to be important in physics because very, most often you get an inhomogeneous situation where there's a, what we call a driving term, right, where there's something external that doesn't have to do with Y. So if I have my harmonic oscillator and I'm driving it with a motor, 
And that motor force might be com not care at all where the position is. So there's just some motor force that's applied all the time. Maybe it's periodic, maybe it's constant, or maybe it's a delta function. Maybe I hit my system. Right? F of t in physics is very often approximated by a delta function, because if you just hit something quickly enough, that's almost like an infinite spike of no time. And so that's another common thing to look at. These are the pieces that come into making it inhomogeneous. The final thing to keep in mind, oh, any questions on that? The final characterization piece to keep in mind is that we, as I said, we often treat these as an eigenvector problem. And this is the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics, which you'll see. And this is an operator. This we think of as a vector, but it's the wave function. And this really is just a number, the scalar, the energy. The key here, don't do what some students occasionally do. Don't cancel out the size and make it equal h equal e. Because of course you can't do that with vectors, right? We, we, have, we need inverses and things don't always have inverses. So this really is a case where you can't just cancel the psi from each side. And we already did the obvious case of this where our operator was d by dt. We acted on y and it was equal to lambda y and we came up with y equals a e to the lambda t. But the reason I highlight this to you is the one other set of things we will do is systems of equations. So this is treating our single differential equation with linear algebra as a linear vector problem, as an eigenvalue eigenvector problem. You also will have the case where you literally have a vector of variables, y, that the differential equation is given by an actual matrix times the variables y and maybe with a driving force or not. And this could be a first order, could be a second order case. And the point is, this might happen, let's suppose I have six masses on springs. Then my y will be the vector of y1, y2, so on down to y6, the position of each of those masses, depending on the springs and the way they're coupled, right, for each of those, I would just do what I did with my human zombie box. I would draw down the links, I would apply f equals minus kx, and for each of these, I would have an equation dy1 equals a whole bunch of other stuff that includes y1 through y6. And then I can look at that equation and rewrite it as a matrix, because the matrix gives me all the couplings because matrix multiplication will work to make this single matrix equation represent my coupled individual equations. And once I have it in this form, I can then do things like change my basis to a form where the matrix is diagonal and then my equations are no longer coupled. They're new coordinates and I found what we call the normal modes, which are the modes that are the natural ones for the system where the system decouples. And so this is a huge idea in physics, is taking a system of differential equations, finding a change of basis, and, normal, and, and getting the normal modes. So when we do differential equations, that's why I say it looks like a brand new topic, but we're going to use a lot of the machinery from linear vector spaces and in two very different ways. One, treating it as an infinite dimensional vector space and looking for eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and two, using a finite matrix, using eigenvalues and eigenvectors to diagonalize this matrix so that we can decouple the equations and then solve it. So two very different methods. <laughs>